Thank you, everybody. So um, I'm actually really excited for this panel. Uh, I've been uh, secretly uh, waiting and uh, uh, geeking out with uh, these people. Um, they built some really impressive technology for their companies. Uh, they started some new initiatives. They also do it for other companies. Um, and these are probably some of the most advanced um, setups that I've seen and, and technologies kind of taking the marketing um, uh, to the next level. And so uh, really excited to have our panelists today uh, talking about what they've done. And um, hopefully, you know, that will give us all a lot of inspiration and cool ideas. Um, so I think it would be awesome if you guys kind of started presenting yourself. I'm Dave Riggs, and I, my company is useracquisition.com. Hi, Yark from Rambrovio. Uh, my name is Dan, and I work at Network. Awesome. And so today's panel, we actually designed that in a slightly different format, which I need the clicker for, or actually you guys did. Um, we're basically going to present three uh, presentations for each panelist, kind of talking a bit about what they've done uh, in their project, and then we're going to ask them some questions. So, there you go. All right, so um, my presentation is about why to build UA automation tech, and I'm going to talk about three specific tools. Uh, the third one is my, my favorite. Um, so my company is useracquisition.com, uh, ua.com, that's actually Under Armour, but uh, I got the next best domain, user acquisition. Um, so <laughs> we do uh, two things mainly. So we create uh, custom uh, UA automation tools, and I'm going to show you a couple examples. And then we also upgrade companies' MarTech stacks. And the reasons are to save time and increase efficiency, and we also uh, help increase your ROI by doing so. And then some of my clients are here, Fox, Riot, Wag, shout out to you guys. Um, so why should we invest? So the thing is with UA is that a lot of what you are doing on a daily basis I find can be automated. So uh, you know, I was running UA for a long time and I was changing bids and changing budgets and a lot of it's the same thing over and over again. Uh, so we can actually automate a lot of that now, uh, and especially because there's APIs for almost anything as well. Um, it's also easier and cheaper than you think, and I'm going to show you some examples on that. And uh, repetitive stuff sucks. So, um, but what can't be automated, and it's probably going to take a really long time until you can, is, uh, is creating a new app or launching in a new geo. You still need humans for that, and on the creative side, uh, it's really hard to have a, a computer do a, a beautiful, you know, 3D video or, or playable, so we still need humans for that. Okay, so every time I talk to companies, they have uh, reasons why they don't invest in uh, UA automation, so I'll walk through those. So um, number one, don't know where to begin, so good news, I'm gonna give you some uh, places to start. Uh, number two, uh, no engineering resources. Uh, the good thing is, is that some of these tools don't really require a lot of engineering, so that's nice. Uh, number three, uh, are UA budgets maxed out? And I think that that's, uh, it's really important to carve off uh, part of your UA budget for MarTech. It's, uh, it just makes things a lot more efficient. And number four, there are off-the-shelf uh, off tools for UA automation, but what I find is that every company is very different. So what I've built for Fox and then for Riot and WAG, for example, they're all going to be very different. So it's hard to find a one tool fits all because you're going to want to iterate and build on top of it. And then number five, I uh, love doing UA and spreadsheets, said no one ever. <laughs> so number one, I think a lot of you guys have probably heard about this one, so segment. So the nice thing is you can add your segment SDK to the apps and basically turn on and off integrations in the background. And so I love taking the control away from the engineers and letting marketing people actually do these things. And so uh, one trick also is if you want to test out Singular, you can also get this, you can justify segment because you want to do a bunch of other MarTech and then just flip on Singular in the background. Uh, you know, that's, we, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, and then implementing a MarTech stack quickly, I think speed is key. Uh, so standardizing events in one pipeline. So instead of send, sending all of your events to Facebook and to Google and to Mixpanel and to Amplitude and all those places, you can actually send them all to segment and then it standardizes them to all the other places really easy. And then number three is non-engineers can set up MarTech. So that's really nice because you don't, you don't have to rely on engineers. And number two is singular. So the reasons to use the Singular's reporting API is, uh, so I actually don't really log into Singular very often because with all our clients, we use the reporting API and get all that data in the database so we can join it with their existing attribution provider if they have another one or uh, their backend revenue data. And so on the right side is an example of a, a cohort and break even investment model where we look at spend, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do this, 
you look at spend on each cohort and then how long it takes to recoup that spend. And that's a really, really important way of looking at it. So um, Singular is outstanding for that. All right, and then number three. So this is one that you guys probably haven't heard of. It's called Retool. And so you can build custom internal tools fast. And I think there's a, like a little demo. So this is like a 15 second explainer video. So I'm using this for Fox and then probably for some other clients as well. Uh, but essentially what you can do is you can build tools very, very quickly. And so you need a little bit of SQL and JavaScript knowledge, but you don't have to be a, you don't have to hire a $200,000 senior software engineer. You could have a data analyst and maybe half their salary actually build a whole bunch of stuff. So um, it's really fast, it's really cheap. And so I'll show you some examples of what we built. All right, so number one, so campaign management. So. Um, so I know we've got Riot Games here, and Cody Christie is the UA lead for Riot Games. He's actually going to spend a lot of money in UA, and I, I told my partner I'm not going to do this, but I'm actually going to pitch him on stage on this, so imagine this. <laughs> so imagine that you don't have to actually log into Facebook and Google or Tapjoy or Bungrel, all the other places. You can log into one single platform and do all of your bids and your budget changes from there. So instead of actually logging into all these different places, you log into one place and do your, your changes there. The best part, though, is that you can program recommendations on these bids. So if your yield is under a certain threshold, then it recommends you lower your bid or lower your budget. And so you can actually program these rules. And then the best part is that on the right side, you can have accept or deny recommendations. So you're actually not even thinking. You log in every morning, all of your networks are there, and you're like accepting or denying recommendations. So this is a lot faster, and we're actually taking a step further at Fox, and we have data scientists that are running all the models. And so the data scientists are judged based on how many of the recommendations are accepted. So they're continuing to refine the model. So the, the holy grail is that you're not even doing anything on the UA side. You're literally just pumping creative in the system. And then the system is then optimizing all your campaigns based on these, these UIs. And then number two is creative management. So you can actually upload creative into the system. You can do a one-click sync with Facebook. So instead of uploading all your assets to Facebook, it's really, these are really simple APIs. I mean, the marketing API for Facebook's been around for a long time. And then you can launch campaigns with creative and run split tests. Um, your campaign, your creative names match the ad names on the network so you can do joins and performance data. And then my favorite is the reporting feedback loop. So when your designers give you creative, you can actually give them a report back with the creative in a zip file and a, a beautiful report that tells them which ones worked, which ones didn't work, and that way they can go make more or you know, help you rotate the, the, the creative. So this has been an amazing time saver for us. So you know, it's pretty easy to do with Retool. All right, so a quick recap why to build. So obviously you need, fewer, you need to hire fewer people. So we're all about, I'm all about hiring as few people as possible and then having them, and going a little bit heavier on the tech side to, to automate some of this stuff. Um, but you know they're more efficient and then your existing people are working on higher level stuff like creative analysis and data analysis and things that computers can't do that well. Um, and then the three tools recommend is Segment uh, for implementing MarTech quicker and then Singular obviously and then Retool for building tools really, really, really fast. And so I think that smart investment in UA automation will pay for itself and make your life easier. Cool. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, first of all, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is uh, definitely one of the most advanced setups uh, I've seen, and you know, we talked to a lot of great companies. And um, I guess you know, my first question to you is, um, what? How do companies justify usually starting such a project? How do you guys consult together and figure out, let's make that investment? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's usually me pitching them on why they need to do it, just like I did right here, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think the key is that you just don't want to be hiring a whole bunch of media buyers for uh, these things because, again, there's so much repetition. So when they see that, okay, you can build tools that are going to increase your enterprise value because they're customized to your company, uh, you don't need to hire a whole bunch of people, you can actually launch more titles and more uh, campaigns without having to uh, hire more, more media buyers. So I think people really like it when they realize that they can be more efficient with a smaller team. Cool. Uh, no, I think it's um, it, it's crazy, and I, I mean it's really impressive. And um, you know, must have been like a long journey. Can you share some mistakes you made? Um, you know, building that probably been a big iterative process. Yeah, I mean for sure. So, well, one specific to Singular is that I, I spent probably a good week 
of coding time trying to, to replicate Singular's campaign analytics. And so I was writing APIs to pull the spend from Facebook and Google and Bungle and all these different places and then try to normalize it in one schema and then deal with time zone math and you know just it's just a nightmare. So I actually spent a lot of time and that's when I realized that like you want to build certain things but there's tools like Segment and Singular and Retool that off the shelf um, are much better. So I think you know you have to be smart about what you build versus buy but if unless you uh, work for Singular then your core business is probably not ETL and so don't try to do that because um, it's fucking hard. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and I guess you know last last question I had is um, you know, when you're kind of building this technology, um, there's uh, sort of ownership of the IP. Do you build it with your own stack? And could you build in the customer's platform? You know, we once talked about maybe you build it in Singular if we had this expansion for apps. Like, how do companies think about that? Like, who owns the code? And, you know, is it yeah. my proprietary IP or not? Yeah, so every everything that I build for each client is unique, and it has to be. And so, you know, there's still fundamental foundation foundational elements like Singular or the data model or uh, Retool um, but all of, everything is customized. And so part of the reason why I'm an advocate of building these things is that uh, every company's uh, needs are unique. So it's, it's actually pretty hard to reuse. You can reuse general concepts, but the actual tool itself, every media buyer or every product manager is going to have different preferences of what they want. So I've thought about trying to turn this into a SaaS business. And, and it's just, you know, again, every client is just so different. And so I'm you know, for now, I'm just uh, working with individual clients and then building it custom for them. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for more questions. Um, moving on. Yarko, stage is yours. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. So I, we have, we have heard, heard the whole, whole day about, about all the all the stories of especially about the marketing tech tech and I'm grateful that Gary actually asked asked me to share some perspective actually from the other side of the coin on the on the monetization side and how we how we see things from the from actually from the media media side where we're actually serving all the all the ads that we all are 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 kind of running. And I'm not gonna spend too much time about talking Talking about our, our company, I'm, I'm sure you, a lot of you have played our games, seen our merchandise, and 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 also saw saw the movies that that we have made. So the question that we are asking from our ourselves when when we are kind of kind of monetizing with with ads and running ads in our our games is is really that that what is the right moment to show the ad to a player and and what kind of ad should, should we actually be showing. And, and which which player should be showing that ad? And it seems to be pretty trivial when you when you think at at the, at the first side, but it, it can be actually extremely complicated question to to answer. And how we approach it is is that when 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 we kind of start designing the ads in an ads placement in our our games, we really we really start from the perspective that hey, how we make it actually fun. For the for the player, how we actually make it such that it actually adds value to the player, and, and the players are actually happy to engage with the advertising, and how, how we make sure that it actually also the players who, who engage with the ads are are happily doing that, and, and the ads actually increase the retention, because when when we do that, that actually leads to a much higher engagement also with the ads, leading in a way that the ads are shown in a positive context, and and. People are much more receptive for, for the ads, and then the ads actually perform also for the advertiser, which is extremely important, of course, for 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 us us to, to kind of make any any re re sustainable revenue out of that. And when when thinking through that is is that building that successfully is is actually a lot of, of design work on, on on the game side, exactly making sure that hey, is this the right moment? To, to the player that it makes sense for the player and also that that it's a good spot for for the for the advertiser as well and, and finding the spots that that the player can actually take the moment and engage with the ad and and even even leading for for install or conver conversion and it's it's not only only managing managing the, the the kind of tech stack that of course is is important as as well and then we were thinking when we, we kind of consider our our internal 
technology, all, all internal technology, but, but especially the, the advertising technology that we are, we are, we are, we are building internally, we are, we are definitely not, not doing it to, to save costs. Or, or, or trying to just kind of, kind of uh, build technology that we can we can run and operate by ourselves because I, I can assure you that it's it's usually more much more expensive than taking off the shelf solutions. Or, or we are not not usually fine to to heavy kind of strategic reasons either for 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 building tech internally because if there's external external tech that works well why why just not using that so so the the only reason that we, we want to build anything internally is that that, that we want to do something basically next level stuff that or, or unique to us that just doesn't exist in the in the market on the on the off the shelf solutions and this is a little busy slide but uh but I just the, the message that I want to want to tell with this that you can, you can see that we don't have any waterfall any, anymore. So, in in a way, how we have built built our kind of internal deck is that everybody gets the first look at the same time. So we have been seeing seeing today a lot of cool kind of UA solutions, and and Dave and Dan are are sharing their awesome products that they're building. But in the end, if, even though you have great UA tech, it's useless if you don't get the access to the inventory. And, and that's on, on our side that what, what we, are, we are trying to, to kind of figure out that how we actually provide everyone the first look and, and fair access to the inventory. And, and not in a way that you have waterfall, that you have 16 line items that, that make it impossible for someone, someone to actually get that inventory, even though they would be willing to pay for it. So we have a lot, bunch of partners that are, are directly already bidding into our, our inventory and for those networks and some partners that, that cannot bid yet directly inventory, our own technology actually bids for them. So, so our system still works, works on a bidding lo logic completely. And one, one big item for us as well is that, that we are running all our cross promotions in, within the same logic and we are using the similar kind of attribution and, and the similar logic for for defining the profitability of of the gross promo campaigns that we are we are we are kind of using using for for external ua and, and also run, running the same campaigns and attribution and, and reporting on on similar on on those campaigns as well so even the internal cross promotions are on the basically on a level playing field with with everything else that we're running and and then what we really want to foster in the whole industry is, is, is to provide the, the fair and equal and as transparent as possible access for, for ad, all advertisers to our inventory. And, and also figuring out the ways that, hey, what, what we can do better, what are the signal, signals that we can, we, can, we can, and we need to be able to provide for the advertisers that they are more comfortable of, of actually bidding, bidding for, the, for, for, the, for the inventory and for the users. And, and of course, we want to automate as, as much as, as possible of, of all that, that stack that make it, make it easier for, for us to run without managing 16 different waterfalls and, and fiddling with the settings every, every single day. And, and I, I think that then the, the third and, and most interesting and, and challenge for, for the future is also that, that basically using all the intelligence that we are, for example, using on a live ops and, and bringing those those technologies closer to the ad tech as, as well that we can we can use all the intel that we get get from from the players to also improve their experience on the on the ad side. Thank you, and and we have the movie two coming up since summer. Go oh. see it. <laughs> this this the, yeah this is this is awesome. Um, I think um, you know I was really excited when you agreed to come in and speak because. I think Rovia is one of the most advanced uh, setups for ad monetization that I've seen, and um, I mean, you guys definitely chose to invest in this path. Um, and you know, I'm curious. You guys built a lot of tech. What is the next challenge for you? What's the biggest thing that you know top of mind for you now? I think it's really like I mentioned is is because usually how you say that hey you're running your live ops and and in game events and how you and, and building tech for example on machine learning how you how you set up automatically the difficulty of mm -hmm. of 
of the game or, or progress and, and, and kind of personalizing the content and the playing experience. Uh, but, but that tech and that intelligence is usually kind of separate from, from the advertising technology the that product. you use for the, monet, for the monetization. So how you actually bridge those two pieces together that you can actually then start taking the ad monetization better in, in, into account on o- almost at the user level on, on, on the and, and ad, ad monetization basically becoming a live ops tool in, in a way as well. That's phenomenal. Yeah, that would be really awesome. Um, and so, you know, c- keeping that in mind to fulfill that vision, what do you think is like the, if we're looking only in ad monetization technology, what would be the, the biggest thing that would make you happy, like the silver bullet? Is there something, some technology or? Of course, I'll be happy in trying to, to kind of spearhead the, the whole header bidding, bidding, bidding transformation from in, in the industry, moving away from the waterfalls. And I think all the, all, all the, all the advancement there will, will definitely be, be big for, I think for the, for the both sides and also be a big thing for the advertisers because for the first time, it's actually putting more leverage on and more power on the advertiser side to basically choose exactly what impressions they, they want to bid for and how much they're going to pay for it. And you think in a world where let's say hater bidding takes over whatever network, um, does this challenge become much simpler, essentially? Like at least the I, I really hope so. Yeah. Uh, well, and in a way that, like I said, it, it's, it's put more more power to the, the ad side. So, so, so it, it should kind of make, make everyone's life up easier. Cool. Okay. So in the, uh, kind of in the spirit of learning from mistakes, any mistakes building this tech that you guys can teach us? Well, well uh, th- that would take the whole the whole afternoon, but 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 for example, one one thing that I, I a little bit disagree with Dave, Dave that you, you said that hey hey building things to yourself is is easy and fast and 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 some some mistake that we do all the time is that grossly underestimating the the effort and, and time it actually takes and and the investment it takes to build build the stuff in in house for sure. Cool, awesome. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name's Dan. I work at Network. The energy in this room is palpable. It's beautiful. <laughs> Remember, I'm the only thing between you and break, so you have to engage. You have to woot and clap and stand up, because if not, I'm going to stand here all fucking day, and you are not going anywhere. Uh, um, this is the title called Why You Should Care. Um, we are a uh, uh, KP-backed gaming startup operating in stealth for a pretty long time. Um, made $105 million last year on Legendary, which was, um, you know, growth from 45 the year before and bigger this year again. So um, we have more games in the market that are coming. We uh, recently signed a large IP as well. And so we're kind of like working through the game process, bringing something from, you know, where it should be to where it deserves to be. Um, and that's actually really important for this and the marketing, marketing stack that we built because everything started with Legendary. It's one of the hardest games in the world to acquire for. You can ask Nebo, we've been at Machine Zone, I made a load of mistakes there, been at Zynga, made a, more mistakes there. And it's, it's just really, really hard to acquire for. It's a dark um, Eastern RPG card battler. I mean, like, that's literally the worst product to try and market <laughs> in the world. Um, good news is we have great art. Looks like this. Um, and, you know, we've managed to make it work, despite ourselves and the product. And so, um, we're, you know, we've been live since August 2016, so nearly two and a half years. Done 171 live events. Live operations is the lifeblood of, of our game. Um, we run a new event every single week. And we try and expect continuity from uh, the marketing creative all the way through to the game itself. And so that's also important. The live operations has to be plugged into the marketing tech stack that you have. Um, You know, we built a load of stuff. And so we always had an idea of kind of like turning this out to third parties. As we were going through these problems, we hit all of these challenges along the way. We have extremely high uh, CPIs. 
we have extremely high LTVs, we have reasonably low scale, but our opt is kind of $3 plus. And so we're in a world that not very many people live in. Um, and that brings with it some unique challenges. And those unique challenges actually are really hard to solve. And so you need to tie everything together and grow all of your kind of like internal knowledge and then apply those to the marketing stack that you have. So these are all the things we built. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through them very quickly um, to give you an idea of the things that I think if you're in a situation like us, uh, you need to have built internally in order to be successful. Um, you need real-time data collection. Like there's no way that you can survive in this world without having that. We have something like 12 minute latency, half a billion events uh, a day, and we have a small user base. And that scales horizontally, we're like, multi-tenanted, anyway, whatever. And so we can scale, uh, scale as much as we need with as many games as we require uh, sideways. And that's really important to make decisions both on a marketing standpoint from an attribution piece and also from a live operation standpoint from an LTV side. Um, LTV, that's the main reason that the last two companies struggled were that they were fictitious. And so um, what you need to make sure is that you have an LTV that is informed by data always maintained by people, and then any changes to the assumptions that you make around the future forecasting are justifiable. And so you can't use things like multiplier methods where you take day seven RP and you multiply it by 28 because, you know, who knows, because. Um, and you need like robust and dynamic LTV forecasting. And you need that on top of multiple different game formats. We're building a female first uh, fashion RPG. Uh, we're also building a highly casual, highly scaled, uh, real-time multiplier, um, low opt-out game. And we need things that can adapt to the LTV forecasting of those things uh, quickly and dynamically. We use cancer growth rates for our LTV forecasting through machine learning. So the rate at which cancer takes over the kidney is actually similar to the rate at which LTV grows. Um, and so you can leverage things from outside our industry um, to be able to more accurately forecast forward uh, your LTV. It's the core of being able to do marketing. Um, Draper, we talked about creative just now. Um, we essentially built a, a programmatic way to dissect, to um, identify different image categories, dissect different creatives into those buckets, restitch them back together in as many variants as possible, and then automatically deploy them to DSPs, SANs, and all the rest. That allows us to turn one to six creatives into 10 to 100 creatives, which does things like mitigate for uh, creative fatigue, which you guys had spoken about earlier as a, as a big thing. Um, then we're plugged into all the networks. So as, uh, as Dave said, it's actually really easy to plug into, for example, Facebook's marketing API. It's been around for an eon, hasn't, doesn't change that much. Um, and it's actually relatively easy to build into and, uh, and then get the information out of. And so you can do automated uh, campaign creation, especially if you have things like Draper, to then kind of create campaigns on the fly, removes the requirement to scale bodies with spend, which is the largest challenge any of us are facing. Um, it means you don't have to say, well, okay, uh, for every $250,000 or $500,000 a month, I'm gonna add a headcount. You can suddenly start scaling disproportionately to your headcount, which is useful. Um, last bit is, we found that um, LTV is set extremely early. Framing, uh, framing and start points are exceptionally important to the payback windows. And so one of the most important things is to be able to distribute content based on things like attribution, geo, device, um, you know, behavior, in-game uh, in -game metrics that you have that indicate high value users. And you have to do that quickly, uh, deliberately, and successfully. And so one of the things we built was uh, machine learning on the front end to be able to do price personalization. Um, but it also does things like uh, guild recommendation. So when you come in, it'll identify the health of your behavior, the health of the guilds that we have, and then it will match those two things together to reduce churn rates, which inflects on LTV. And you really need to focus on the front end of your system in order to maximize the payback windows at the back. Um, we also can do things like store management, content serving, that's kind of like basic. And then the last thing is you have to have robust uh, attribution. And so Singular, yay. Um, and so uh, we've worked with them for a really long time. Um, I first started working with Absalar pre 
acquisition merger um, and have been working them for seven years. And so they're obviously um, a core part of being able to do things like treat someone that comes from Facebook differently than someone that comes from Incent in Azerbaijan, right? And so those two things are very important as well. And the, and the latency that you have there to be able to identify attribution windows is actually really important to be able to change the front end of the software. Um, that's it, done. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess you know my first question uh, when I when I saw this, um, and I kind of read the news when you guys announced the scale platform. Um, I was asking myself. I mean, you know, there's I guess there's a few companies certainly in this audience have spent a lot of money. Same as you guys have a scalable team, um, but yet you guys chose to turn what you have into a platform, kind of bring more people. What what led to that decision? Um. I think uh, the way that we view the world is we look at it, um, we want to make subjectively good games and objectively great businesses. And for that, what we mean is games that we love, that we play, um, but also games that have a cost of acquisition which is less than the LTV, and so at some DX. And so those requirements, while they sound obvious, um, are not always the requirements, I think, for game makers. And so we identified a set of tools that can decrease the cost of acquisition and maximize the LTV, and we do that, you know, we use those tools all the time on Legendary. And so one of the things we want to do is, uh, it's probably not for anyone in this room, but it's for games that do not have a cost of acquisition that is low enough or an LTV that is high enough. Um, leverage the scale platform to be able to kind of like reduce the cost of acquisition and maximize the LTV and bring something that may have zero value. I mean, if the payback windows are infinite, your value is essentially zero. Um, and turn that into something that has some value. And for us, there's a number of reasons to do that. One, it diversifies the revenue stream. Two, it's a potential acquisition source. And three, it furthers our tech pipeline. And so um, it's a purely selfless number. No, it's a, it's a, it's an obvious um, place in the market for us to, um, for us to focus on, it's not for the rovios of the world. You know, it's not for the people that understand and have built those places. And but it is for the people that are on their kind of like first UA person and need to get to two in order to scale Iron Source effectively and um, don't really know what their CPI or their LTV is and you know don't really know how to act on it. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. I think um, you know we'd love to hear um, over time, kind of hear how you guys are progressing with that platform. I think it's really unique. Um, yeah, too slowly is the answer. To that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we'll stay tuned. Uh, so, I guess one other question I have about network in general. So, it's a it's a company that, um, to me at least, it didn't feel like they're trying to be in the spotlight. And um, you guys, you know, on the one hand, I didn't hear I didn't hear about it a ton. We obviously know you guys, and um, but on the other hand, like you guys have really high caliber people on the team, and you're you know investing in building this amazing technology and now you're kind of making a platform and so you kind of need to be known so there's sort of an interesting dissonance now but what what made network the way it is yeah we have a we have an interesting dichotomy in the in the in the company because uh, you have to really ask yourself why you want to be known um, and so uh, lots of people do it for pride others do it for hiring um, when we've raised in the past or when we've you know we've created these moments in the past and we've communicated about them, we've almost always found the wrong people have come to try and join us. Um, and so we made an intentional decision this time to uh, be as quiet as possible about everything that we did. And we managed to hire people like uh, Nebo and Matt Saunders and Suf was with us for a while. And you know, we have all of these great, uh, you know, these great pieces of, of talent that, that came to join us. Um, and we did that under the radar as, as best as we could. Um, we've now reached a point where that's now getting in the way of our business. And so um, I think we need to be intelligent about how we communicate these things like, like this. Um, we, don't talk, we don't talk very often. Harold is actually here in the front, front as well, and he's recently joined us from Spotify. So we're trying to like flesh out the people that we have with us and then simultaneously um, be diligent about the way that we talk about it. Because um, it's also really far away from where it could be. And so we have a metric for a ton of work to do. Yeah, no, that's incredible. It's definitely unique. Um, so at this point, I actually want to open it up to the audience. I'm sure there's a lot of questions for this audience uh, and this awesome panelist. So if anyone wants to ask questions, 
Uh, please go ahead. Uh, this one's for Dan and about price personalization. Uh, super interesting concept. Have you had any challenge with, challenges with it in terms of people saying I bought something for X and somebody bought something else for Y, that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, is, is the answer. We, um, again, it's kind of like we're bifurcated. Like we, uh, so we built an application called The Network that lives next to Legendary. Um, it is a place where everybody can just hang out. We hired a team in LA to make content about the network, about Legendary. We roll five to seven unique pieces of content out a day to that user's, user base, and we super serve them with information. Um, they can do real-time chat. They can at me or Neil, the CEO, at any time of the day. Um, it's simultaneously the best and worst decision we've ever made. Um, and so we're very far lent into the community. So when we do things, we hear about it immediately. Um, and so the rule sets that we've kind of learned along the way are um, where possible proactively communicate. Um, people are actually not idiots and so they, they kind of like will lean into um, things if they think it's for the betterment of the game. Two, if you're really gonna play around with things, play around with things in the first zero to seven days um, because people haven't built those social bonds yet. You try and do that at the end and um, you'll have a strike on your hands or something. Um, of which we've had seven, so you know, like we're we're, uh, we're definitely within that realm of like extremely engaged, extremely passionate customer base, um, and then and then just do it intelligently, you know, to the best of your ability, and and do things that are also important for them for their quality of life, like the guild recommender instead of the price personalization. Um, but I think yeah, we've we've definitely made made a fair few mistakes along the way. Uh, another question for Dan. Um, I represent a lifestyle app, health and fitness space, and not always comfortable using multipliers, but we use them. <laughs> um, and I was just slacking with some of my colleagues because I, I thought your point was interesting. Like, don't use multipliers. Um, but I wonder if there's a case where you could excuse using them if outside of the gaming context, because I feel that there is a world in which outside of gaming apps have like a longer latency for decision making period and you can study incrementality across markets and you can see things that might actually map to a more consistent ratio that you could then apply to your numbers and is that an ex excusable reason to use things like multipliers to project things even in the LTV or projected revenue case or are you just fully against it in all cases I I think there's beauty and simplicity. I think there's, um, it's an understandable, widely communicated and easily, like, easily grokkable um, way to project LTV. I think it comes down to one, justify your assumptions and two, constantly update. And if those two things are true, if you're consistently and deliberately going back and going, okay, well, uh, what was our multiplier for Facebook in the US? Um, it was 28X you know, DX, now it's 22X, we update and we recalibrate all of our models to understand that. And you do that often enough um, that you don't kind of get caught out between thinking you're better than you are. And then simultaneously, if you can also make sure that um, if you make assumptions that something's going to get better, let's say your product uh, lead says, well, we're going to release, you know, this amazing update and it's gonna double our LTV. And you're okay, well, we'll bake the, that into the assumption about what our payback windows will look, will look like. Those assumptions had better be spot on, otherwise you're essentially burning cash or increasing your cash flow required to scale the business that you have. And so I think as long as your assumptions are justified and you're consistently and deliberately updating the multipliers that you have based on historical data, not based on fictitious numbers, then you'll be fine. Um, I do think there are better ways of doing it. Last questions. This time, not for Dan. <laughs> no, it's okay. You can ask anything. Anything else? Okay. I think people want a break. Okay. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. This has been Thanks. phenomenal. Thank you. Appreciate it.